So in this talk, we'll go through the answer to the questions that we put at the end of the last um, presentation, where we looked at why patients with COVID-19 infections are getting hypoxic, i.e. their blood oxygen levels are dropping. We'll quickly recap the reasons why um, patients with COVID-19 are hypoxic and then think a little bit about how, to, how we could treat the different reasons why these patients are hypoxic. We'll talk about the L phenotype and the H phenotype of COVID-19 infection. So in the L phenotype, if you remember, we talked about the fact that although the alveolus is full of oxygen, the blood supply wasn't getting to the alveolus and therefore the blood was starting to enter and then being stopped off. And it was being stopped off because there were blood clots forming inside the, inside the capillary or you are getting inflammation and spasming of the blood vessels and that again was stopping blood from flowing through. And because there was no blood flowing through, the oxygen couldn't diffuse in because there's no blood here to actually get oxygenated. So let's think a little bit about the first thing, vasculitis. This is inflammation of the um, vessel wall. So if you consider this the normal blood vessel, it's got three layers to it, the endothelium, the bit in the middle, adventitia media, and then the externa. And if you cut it in half, you can see them there. Now what happens in, in inflammation with what we call a vasculitis, you get inflammation of this media and also of the endothelium. And by thickening it all up, can you see how the cross-sectional area here is quite large in a normal vessel, and here when it's inflamed, it's much smaller. And the smaller the blood, uh, the diameter, the less blood flow will go through the um, blood vessels themselves, and therefore the less blood will be oxygenated. So you can do a few things to try and open these up. So you can give something to vasodilate them, to ex open up the um, blood vessels again. And there are two treatments that are being investigated at the moment. One is something called inhaled nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas and it's got a very special place in the body. What it does is it works in these intracellular receptors to actually relax smooth muscle. If you look at the cross section of the artery, all of this sort of orangey colored stuff, this is all smooth muscle. Now, when it's inflamed, it's all contracted down. But if you give nitric oxide, what it does is it relaxes it. And if you imagine relaxing a rubber band, it'll just open itself up. And that's what nitric oxide does. And you can do the same with something called prostacycline, which again acts as a vasodilator, opens up the blood vessels. So by doing both of those, you can hopefully get this very small caliber blood uh, uh, vessel to open up and allow more blood to flow through. So there's a lot of people who we're trialing this on, and this has been around for a while for a variety of different reasons, but certainly we are seeing some improvement in patients who have got severe COVID infection, who are on a mechanical ventilator on intensive care, are seeming to respond to this, but only for a short period of time. And there's a variety of reasons for that but there are trials going on at the moment into how effective this is. The other thing that you could do is to try and reduce the inflammation, try and reduce the amount of inflammatory exudate that's going into the blood vessel and thus causing it to become edematous, i.e. swollen and so big and so pushed down on the vessel wall calibre. So you could give things like steroids or anti-inflammatories and even you can give things like immunosuppressants, which will completely dampen down the inflammatory response from the virus. So on the face of it, that sounds great, because now you can go from this sort of inflamed blood vessel back to a normal blood vessel. The problem here, though, is anything that reduces inflammation is going to increase the amount of virus. The way in which a body fights virus is by causing inflammation and white cells to move in and to destroy all the virus in the infected cells. So if you dampen down that response, 
you can allow the virus to proliferate, to expand and get into the rest of the body <clears throat> and potentially get a lot worse. So even though you might be helping in the short term, you might increase the risk of the patient in the longer term. So again, there are a lot of studies coming out looking at the use of steroids, anti-inflammatories, and looking at immunosuppressants, because we know that although we could potentially make things better, we could also make things a lot, lot worse. The other thing to think about are these microthrombi. This is the blood clots in the vessels themselves. And so if you have anyone with a blood clot anywhere, the usual treatment for this is to give blood thinning medications. And we can give something intravenously in intensive care called heparin. And what heparin does is it breaks up these clots by not allowing more blood to clot around this nidus of clotting. You've got to ask yourself the question, why are these patients becoming more coagulable? I.e., why are they developing these blood clots? And one of the potential thoughts is that it's inflammation and it's swelling of those blood vessels, narrowing of the caliber, which then, and disrupting the endothelium, i.e. the inside covering of the blood vessel. And all of those things allow these um, blood clots to form. Well, again, you could give anti-inflammatories, so steroids, anti-inflammatories and immunosuppressants, with the proviso that we could make the infection worse. But that could be another treatment, and that's another reason we're looking into these treatments in intensive care. Then the other thing is to try and keep the blood less sticky. So what we want to do is to try and let blood flow through easily. If blood sits for a while somewhere, it will clot. You know that's true, because if you cut yourself, you'll get some blood coming out. It'll come up into a big ball. And then if you do nothing, it'll slowly clot and form a scab. However, if you keep wiping it away, more blood will come up, more blood will come up, and it'll never clot. So by trying to keep the blood more watery, i.e. keeping more volume inside the blood supply, what we can potentially do is keep it flowing through, not to stagnate. The converse would be to make someone dehydrated, and if you make someone dehydrated, the blood now becomes like treacle, it's thick and slow moving, and therefore much more likely to clot. So theoretically, to treat microthrombi, we could keep people much more hydrated, give them more IV fluids. And you'll see later on why that could be a problem. But again, getting the right amount of fluid in the blood supply is the key to good intensive care of these patients. So then there's the H phenotype we talked about, where if you remember the chest x-ray, there was lots of white shadowing around because the alveoli are filling up with fluid and inflammatory exudate. The space between the alveolus and the capillary is filling up with lots of um, ex exudate, lots of fluid. And there's lots of sputum around, which is blocking off these alveoli. So the alveoli themselves now aren't getting any oxygen because the oxygen that's trying to come in is getting blocked by the sputum. Also, you're going to have lots of fluid filling up this alveolus. And therefore, any oxygen that's there, it's much harder for it to diffuse down into the blood supply. And also, we're going to have thickening of this vessel wall and the alveolar wall with lots of scarring and inflammation and through doing so it becomes much harder for that oxygen then to diffuse across as well. So for all of these reasons patients then become more hypoxic. So let's think a little bit about how we can treat each of those. Inflammation again. So like I was saying we're going to be increasing the amount of inflammatory exudate and scarring between the alveolus and the vessel wall. So that two cell thickness that the body has um, evolved to have to reduce the friction for oxygen to come into the blood supply has now increased and therefore made it less efficient. Also, lots of fluid and white cells moving into the alveolus to fight infection, all of these things are going to reduce the efficiency of oxygen moving into the blood supply. So 
looking at anti-inflammatories again. The steroids, anti-inflammatories, immunosuppressants could be useful. And what we want to try and reduce as well is the amount of capillary wall inflammation. Because we know that when there's inflammation of vessels or around blood vessels, they become more leaky because then that, that allows the white cells to come out and fight infection. But in becoming more leaky, fluid is going to get into those areas as well. So the lungs themselves become sodden like a wet sponge. And so if you imagine a wet sponge, it's heavy, difficult to open and close and much more likely to have resistance to oxygen diffusing from the alveolus into the uh, blood supply. So we could think about drying out the lungs. Now what I want you to do is just think a little bit about if you've ever been in the bath for a long period of time, you find that your fingers get all pruned. Now some of you may have done these um, experiments when you were in junior science or even in a GCSE or A levels where we look at osmosis. If you imagine a potato cylinder and you put it into pure water, because there's a high solute concentration inside the potato and it's water outside, so there's no solute, you're going to get movement of the um, solute out, if you can, but because there's a semi-permeable membrane there, that movement is not going to happen. And therefore, to equalize the um, osmolalities between the two areas, you're going to get water moving in through that semi-permeable membrane. And so you can see here that the potato wedge swells up. And that's what's happening in patients to some extent with inflammatory exudates. You've got lots of white cells which are producing lots of toxins that's increasing the osmolality inside of the alveoli and so you're going to get more and more leak of plasma into those areas from the blood supply because it's a higher concentration of solute inside the alveolus from all the inflammation. So to try and reverse that you could do the opposite. You could try to increase the osmolality of the blood itself so to make it thicker to make it more concentrated by taking fluid out. And if you imagine the potato wedge again, but now you've got a sugar solution here with a much higher concentration than inside the potato. And so you're now, rather than having water moving into it, you're going to get water moving out of the semi-permeable membrane of the potato and thus your potato is going to shrink in size and that's what we want to do we want to draw water out of the lungs so this is one of the things that we do in intensive care we concentrate up the blood by giving diuretics giving things to try and f flush out water concentrate up the blood and therefore reduce the amount of free fluid or water in the lungs that's impairing oxygen diffusing into the blood supply. Now, those of you who watched the first video are going to know intuitively, actually, that might be a problem. If you remember about the L phenotype, where we've got patients with um, more propensity to developing blood clots, we know that making the blood more thick can increase the number of blood clots that these patients are having. And by increasing the number of blood clots, what happens is that these patients then develop more clots and get worsening of disease. So the problems with intensive care is even though with you might be treating one thing, you might be making another thing worse. So you've got to consider all of these things. You can also remove sputum and this is actually really important and one of the big things in intensive care. When you've put a tube down into the patient's um, lungs, you've now got a conduit that you can pass a little catheter down and suction out sputum. You can give nebulizers. This is basically small atomized water droplets which can then help to break up the sputum. And there's a variety of different drugs that we use as what we call mucolytics i.e. they break up mucus. That can also be nebulized down the endotracheal tube, the tube that goes, sits down in the lungs, and therefore break up that sputum and allow it to be suctioned up. 
and chest physios are really helpful. They can help loosen up sputum by um, banging on the chest wall, moving the patient into different positions and all of those things helping to drain the sputum that's in the lungs out. And then the final thing that you can do is if the lungs just are not working, we can't get them to work, we can't get the oxygen to get into the lungs, we have to find another way to get oxygen into blood. And that way is by using a bypass machine. And this is something called ECMO, or extracorporeal oxygen membrane oxygenation. So ECMO is one of those things that we'll talk a bit about later if you're interested. But essentially what you do in it is you take blood out of the system, we run it through a machine that puts oxygen into the um, blood, and then we push that oxygenated blood back into the body. And that's all it does. It just bypasses the lungs and takes all the blood out, oxygenates it, and then puts it back into the body. So you might think, oh great, why don't we just do that with everyone? Well, you can see here the size of the tubes that have to go in. And you can see how complex all of this machinery is. And a lot of the patient's blood volume is being taken out and put back in very quickly, usually between three and four litres per minute. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and it takes a lot of people and a lot of equipment to do it. So it's not easy, and there's a lot of potential risks to the patient. So it's not something that we do lightly, but certainly if we find that the lungs just are not working, it can be something that we can use to try and treat these patients. If you're interested, we can talk a lot more about them at a later date. However, it's worth just knowing that this is a rescue therapy that we do have for patients and it is quite effective and certainly for patients with um, previous uh, diseases such as H1N1, SARS, MERS, which you may have heard of, or even just the seasonal flu. We've got patients on to ECMO and they have done well. So in summary, there's lots of research. All the things that you came up with as potential treatment possibilities are exactly the things that we're looking at in intensive care to treat severe COVID infections. It's likely that patients aren't just an L phenotype or an H phenotype of COVID, but actually a combination of these things. And so the treatments have to not just target one thing or the other, but think about all of these different things as happening simultaneously. And I hope you can see that by understanding just the basic physiology that you learn at, at junior science and A-levels, IB, these are actually things that we can use to apply to patients and find new treatments and new ways of managing these patients' conditions.